Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deborah Lustig. I'm the Associate Director at the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's event. Um, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Department of Psychology and the Institute for Human Development, and also the um, Latinx Research Center, where we are for providing us the space for this event today. And I want to announce the next event in the ISSI Colloquia series. Um, it's coming up in a while, Wednesday, November 20th. Uh, it's called The Trouble with Inequality, presented by NYU professor of sociology and Cal alum, uh, Jeff Monza. And if you're not on our email list, if you give us your email, we'll send you an announcement about it. Now, if you could please silence your cell phones or anything else you have with you that might make noise. That would be great. So uh, the format for today's event is that Professor Chow will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A after that. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jing Chow. She's Associate Professor of Psychology here at Cal. Uh, she received her PhD from Arizona State, and she's the recipient of the Foundation for Child Development Young Scholars Award, and her work has been published in numerous journals in developmental, cultural, clinical, and educational psychology. Uh, here at Cal, Dr. Chow directs the uh, Culture and Family Study Lab, and her team is conducting an NIH-funded longitudinal study that she's going to be telling us about today, so I want to tell you more about it. Um, and ISSI provided the seed funding for this study, so we're very thrilled to have her here with us to share some of the results. She's now in year two of the study. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Chow. Well, thank you everyone for coming here on a very hot day. <laughs> I also want to thank um, the ISSI for the support and especially Deborah. Um, for, you know, um, over the years. This all started as a very initial idea at that time we got the funding, the seed grant, and that time I was rejected by all the funding agencies. <laughs> so uh, thank you for believing me and um, that led us to do this work. Um, this is also one of my first time talking to an interdisciplinary audience, so I'm very excited, you know, to hear about your, you know, uh, uh, feedbacks and, you know, questions. Um, so I would like to start to focusing on kind of give you some characteristic about the population that we're interested in. Uh, we're interested in you know kind of two, not really two population, but it's kind of one overlapping population. One, although they call in different names in different fields. Children of immigrant families um, in our field is defined as a child who has at least one foreign-born parent, and. Um, one out of four children uh, in the U.S. right now has at least one foreign-born parent, meaning that they are a child of um, immigrant families. And as you can see, just in the last few decades, the share of children of immigrant uh, families in the total U.S. child population has increased significantly. And not only is the number of immigrant or children of immigrant family increased, but also the diversity of country or, or regions of their, you know, where they come from, have become, you know, have um, have shifted, you know, in this country in the last few decades. While, you know, decades ago, where the majority of immigrants come from Europe or Canada, but in the current area, that you know, the U.S. immigrant population come from many different parts of the world. And relatedly, um, the language spoken by, you know, our uh, uh, immigrants is un in this country is also very diverse, and then um, you can see this is from census data. Um, only 16% of immigrants speak English, only English at home, uh, while the you know largest um, sp spoken language is Spanish, followed by Chinese, but also many other languages. Okay, so this brings us to you know the next term I'll be talking a lot in this talk. Um, uh, another name for the population is. Dual language learners, okay. So dual language learner is a term that used a lot in the education field, although it has overlap with children of immigrant family because a lot of times they are the same population, okay. So dual language learners are young children who are learning more than one language at the same time, as well as those children who are learning a second language while continue to develop the first language. 
So the term dual language learner actually refers to a very heterogeneous <coughs> population. Not only children who are we, we call purely bilingual, but also children who study with one language, but then learn in the second language, and maybe switch. Okay, so it's a very heterogeneous population. And um, the number is also pretty large, one out of five children in the US. And, and so, you know, a lot of children immigrant family are dual language learners based on a, you know, a region and language is working at home. And it's one of the fastest growing population. And then here in California is one of the states that has the largest number of dual language learners. And 19% uh, of the uh, students enrolled in uh, California public schools are um, identified as English learners. By the way, when they get to school, uh, sometimes they are called English learners, but they are really the same, you know, same population. Okay. So in our research, we focus a lot on dual language learners from low-income families, and we especially target um, Head Start children. So Head Start, as many of you know, is a uh, you know, federal-funded free early childhood education program for families living under poverty. Okay. So in the, within the Head Start population that the dual language learner um, you know, uh, speak, many have different uh, home languages. And uh, interestingly, uh, the majority of dual language learners in Head Start, as well as in the country, are uh, actually born in the U.S., meaning that they are U.S. citizens and by birth. Uh, but by contrast, the majority of their parents were um, foreign-born, meaning that they are really children of immigrant families. <coughs> okay. And um, another thing to keep, you know, to highlight is that uh, for dual language children enrolled in Head Start, that majority of their parents do not speak fluent English. So only 36% of them uh, reported as understanding English well or very well. Okay. So um, speaking of dual language learners, and uh, one of the things that's getting a lot of attention um, in, in the literature is when they start school, when they get into the school system, they do face many challenges in their academic development. And uh, a lot of this research looking at achievement gap, uh, comparing dual language learners with children from you know, monolingual English speaking families that um, a lot of this research were conducted with Latino dual language learners because that's the largest group you know, um, in the country. And, and this research um, have consistently showed that there is achievement gap between dual language learners and, and children who grow up uh, in you know, monolingual English speaking homes, that achievement gap starts actually quite early. So um, for example, by age four or five, that Latino dual language learners, they score um, behind uh, monolingual norms in English receptive and expressive vocabulary and listening comprehension. And then during pre-kindergarten or kindergarten, uh, Latino DRLs that they have lower English phonological awareness and letter identification. So those are kind of building blocks of reading skills um, compared to monolingual in English speaking children. And um, looking across the, you know, the education you know, uh, uh, grade that Latino DRLs have lower levels of uh, school achievement compared to non-Hispanic whites throughout the school from K to 12. And researchers have some hypothesis about you know, what's accounting for the achievement caps or you know, um, uh, what's the mechanism. And one of them they hypothesize is that the English oral language skill, uh, because the majority of US public schools still use English as predominant you know, language of instruction, so English oral language skill is a very important skill for children to get engaged in learning and you know, learning other academic subjects. So the DLLs who fall behind on English language skills, all language skills at school entry, is an important obstacle for them to you know, catch up to learn other subjects in school. And that's you know, partly explaining uh, the achievement gap that's <coughs> persisting throughout the grades. And we should also keep in mind that you know, achievement gap associated with DLL status is also compounded in another part that may be accounted for by the differences in social economic status. Okay. And even within the head start population, so family who are already living uh, in, with low income, that the DLLs in head start actually are even more poor than the non-DLL household in head start. Okay. 
and also um, children from DL families, they are more likely compared to children from um, non-DL families or, <laughs> or English speaking families, they are more likely to have parents with lower education and um, also, they tend to come from a family with less, in, in you know, psychology education we call uh, language or literacy resources at home. So things like um, number of books, and uh, they may have fewer books, they may engage in less kind of home reading activities with other family members, and they may have, you know, engage in fewer home learning activities with other family members. And these home, you know, literacy activity, especially during early childhood years, are important ways to getting children ready for school. And and you know what research shows show is that the DIL children, they seem to be, you know, lacking behind, you know, because of the, uh, uh, you know, differences in home learning or home literacy environment. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, I also you know want to highlight that not. In the DILs, they do face challenges in the education and development, but they also face, you know, they also have developmentally unique opportunities compared to children who grow up in, you know, when language. Um, one of them is the potential of becoming bilingual. And as I will talk later, there is some research suggesting that being bilingual can potentially have some cognitive uh, benefits for children's development. And also because language is a gateway for us to being exposed to a new culture. So um, their potential to become bilingual also allows them the potential to be exposed to different sets of cultural values and knowledges and ideas. And at least in adult studies that research has shown that individuals who are bicultural, so they can integrate components from different two different cultures, um, they are associated with mental health or social emotional benefits. But we don't know whether this will generalize to children, the young children, they are still learning the language and being exposed to the culture. So in our research, uh, uh, it's guided a lot by um, this famous theory in uh, psychology or developmental psychology, the ecological model. So the idea that the children, um, they are influenced by multiple environments, including environments that interact on a daily basis, like the family, school, uh, appears, but they are also impacting by the larger environment, like you know, cultural or you know, societal norms. But how do we understand, you know, digital factors like immigration status, you know, the cultural orientations, or you know, the cultural norms of a community on children's development? We have to understand how do those factors impact the context that children interact on a daily basis. So how does those things? impact parents' interaction with children? How does you know, cultural orientation or language impact children's relationship with teachers? How do they impact children's interaction with neighborhood? So in our research, we try to you know, measure you know, uh, uh, those things in different boxes, uh, including the children's proximal context, children's psychological processes. So we try to you know, use multivariate approach to kind of paint a com you know a, a complex picture try to unpack what are the different chains you know of influences from the digital social cultural factor to you know children's eventual developmental outcome. So an important construct for immigrant family, um, a contextual characteristic, um, is called cultural orientation. So what is cultural? Cultural is actually everything we have. Cultural is the language we spoken. Cultural is the food we eat. Cultural is the joke we make. Cultural is you know, um, you know the, the the rituals we have. So cultural is actually a multi-dimensional you know dynamic you know uh, uh, process for each individual. And in immigrant families, culture gets more complicated because each immigrant they have at least two types of cultural orientations. Um, one is the cultural orientation of their heritage culture. For example, for Chinese American immigrants, they have a Chinese orientation which reflects their engagement into you know, different aspects of the Chinese heritage culture. And they are also exposed to what we call the host culture or the receiving culture elements 
Um, so they may also have a you know American orientation. So while in early research and immigrant research countries think that you just have one dimension of cultural orientation, so if you become Americanized, then you are losing your heritage culture. But in later research that with empirical data that we have shown that cultural uh, orientation can be pretty independent in immigrants that they can, you know, simultaneously you know endorse and engage with both cultures. And to make things more complicated, uh, more recent research on cultural orientation suggests that even within a single culture, for example, you know, uh, American culture, that uh, immigrants' you know, endorsement or engagement in different components of that culture can vary by their life domains. So a simple example is that an immigrant can be very proficient in English, you know, high on that domain of cultural orientation, but they may not be endorsing, you know, American or individualistic value. So their uh, engagement of the cultural elements in the values or identity domain can be very separate from their behavior or language engagement in that cultural domain. So that does make things a lot complicated. So we not only just have one cultural variable, we have two cultural and then multiple dimensions. So it does create kind of more challenges, but also complexity in research on immigrant families. So in our research, um, one of our initial questions, uh, this is work I conducted earlier before this current study, is to understand how does cultural orientation shape parents, shape immigrant parents, um, how they uh, you know, um, interact with, child, with children on emotions. So in psychology research, we have a construct called relate, emotion-related parenting practices. So these are things like how parents respond to children's emotion, how parents talk to children about emotion, and how, how, how parents you know, help children cope with emotions. And uh, why are these things important? So why do we focus on emotion-related parenting practices? Because, you know, uh, parents are, especially in early and middle childhood, an important, you know, uh, figures that are impacting how children learn social emotional skills. So uh, psychology research, this is work by many developmental uh, psychologists, they have shown that there are primary three ways that parents can, you know, impact in children's social emotional development. The first way is by modeling. So how parents, you know, I'm a parent, how we express our emotions are actually shaping how children respond to emotion because they learn it by observing. Okay? And then the second is that parents may engage in um, things like talking to children about emotion or, you know, uh, helping children, you know, walk through the things when they encounter something stressful. So those are what we call the direct coaching approaches where parents directly teach children about emotion. And then the third way that parents may impact children's emotion by influencing the family's overall emotional atmosphere. So for example, by creating a warm, close uh, relationship with the child that research shows to be promoting children's social emotional development. Um, on the other hand, you know, a conflict in the family, like interparental conflict or family conflict, that these negative emotional climates may disrupt children's emotional regulation and impair the social emotional development. Okay. So uh, emotion-related parenting practices is one important mechanism for us to understand how family impacting children's social emotional development. One of the things that's interesting from the cultural lenses is that cross-cultural research shows that different cultures do differ in terms of how parents react to children about emotion, how parents express emotion to children, and how parents talk about emotion. So this is a lot by you know, researchers doing cross-cultural research. They compare parents in America uh, with parents in China or in other parts of the world. And um, um, I'm just going to highlight some of the key you know, findings, especially regarding uh, the uh, East Asian culture, uh, like Chinese culture, compared to the West culture or European American culture. And one thing is that, you know, uh, um, researchers found that East Asian culture, they consider, you know, collective culture, they tend to value a restraint or control of emotion because a lot of times open expression of emotion can be disruptive to interpersonal relationship. And by contrast, um, individuals from Western or what they call individualistic cultures tend to value open expression of emotions. 
So these cultural differences in values have been actually found in some behavior finding in terms of how often or how frequently individuals from different cultures express emotions. And what's interesting is that they found the cultural differences is more consistent when you ask the individuals to rate their emotions. So when they ask you know, individuals to rate how much you feel after you're giving them a stimuli, that individuals from European American culture tend to rate the experience to be higher. Okay. But on the other hand, they don't show any differences in facial expression or you know, nonverbal behaviors of emotion. And one of the hypotheses is that you know, self-reported emotion may be more capturing the conscientious process of emotion expression, and that's more susceptible to cultural influences. But you know, facial expression may be more susceptible, may be more impacted by automatic you know, process that's less influenced by values. And our research, we, we had some of the similar findings on differences in different components of emotion. And in addition to kind of degree to which you know, individual express emotion varied by culture, uh, research also found that there's cultural differences in what kind of emotions that parents tend to express towards their children. Um, for example, European American mothers, they express in more positive emotions like praising or cheering towards the children compared to a Chinese mother. And another study found that um, the Chinese parents, when their children experience something successful, they did something you know, uh, successfully, the, the parents express less praise compared to European American parents. And then when children you know, failed something, that the parents gave more criticism. And so these cultural differences are explained by you know, many potential uh, uh, explanation, including kind of cultural differences in the values of parental control and training. Okay? But you know, it gives up some ideas about kind of you know, how would parents you know, respond to children's emotion are you know, shaped by their cultural values and, and the norms. Another thing researchers found is that um, parents from Chinese culture, they also talk less about emotion. So when you know, researchers ask parents to talk about past events with their children, and what they found is that the European American parents, they tend to engage more what they call emotion talk. So you know, talking about feelings, talking about causes of feelings, and they also tend to engage in a more elaborative conversation style. So they try to engage children into the conversation about emotions. By contrast, um, the you know uh, Chinese mothers, you know, in China, they tend to focus on a more kind of didactic style of talking. So they tend to more focus on the behaviors and the consequences of behaviors. So this gives us some interesting idea about you know cultural difference in emotion expression. But a lot of these studies comparing child parents from one culture to another. Um, so, you know, when you find a difference, you cannot explain why is there a difference. What's accounting for the difference? So, we are taking a different approach. We're looking at a group of immigrant parents, all from the same cultural background, but they vary in terms of their, you know, engagement in house culture and heritage culture. So we can look at a culture in a more dynamic, you know, fluid way than you know just group-based comparisons. So um, we did this um, in the context um, of a longitudinal study. This was a study we did, you know, uh, we started years ago, but still ongoing. Um, this study looks at um, just. You know, one group of children from immigrant family, which are Chinese American children from immigrant family. So we started with a sample um, of uh, 250 Chinese American children at first and second grade. Um, all those children have at least one foreign born parents. Actually, the majority of the parents were foreign born. And 76% um, of the children were born in the US, um, we call second generation, and then the rest are first generation. And we recruited this sample actually in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, when we recruited this sample, we worked hard to try to oversample Chinese American families from low income background because we want to be able to tease out the effect of social economic status from culture. Okay. So uh, we you know, targeted a lot of community and school that serve a lot of low income families. And as a result, more than half of the sample are families who uh, we, you know, are, are children eligible for free or reduced lunch um, at school, meaning that they're from low-income families. And um, we follow this sample 
for over 10 years. So we started when the children were first to second grade. We did two waves of assessment when the children were in elementary school, uh, both very comprehensive lab assessment. Um, and then at the last way, we collected surveys from the parents and the, um, and the youth. So we've been following this family over 10 years. I'm going to be primarily talking about the first wave of data. And um, how do we measure you know, emotion socialization or parenting practices on emotion? One of the tasks we use is called a parent-child emotion talk task. So in this task, we just get parents, all parents have the same book, um, it's a book with just pictures and no words. And we tell the parents to use whatever language they, uh, they like to tell the story to the child. Okay. And what's interesting about this book is that it's about a boy who lost his pet frog and then he tried to you know, find it in the forest. So there are many um, opportunities in this book that parents can engage in conversation about emotion. So for example, uh, here this parent said he loved his frog a lot and of course his dog too. And then this parent said they're always scary. So you can see that you know, these conversations involving the use of emotion words. Okay? And um, then you know, we video, coded, video recorded all the whole conversation and then we have a bilingual research assistant to go through each you know, a conversation and code it on the standardized you know, manual the number of emotion words parents use, how many times they ask questions about emotion, how often do they provide explanation about emotion. We also coded the overall quality or the level of elaboration of parents' emotion talk. And so in this first paper um, that was led by my former graduate students, um, we looked at you know, among a group of Chinese American immigrant mothers. And, um, what is the association between their levels of cultural orientation and how often they use emotion talk? And what we found that you know, after you're controlling for you know, socioeconomic status, the language they use, how long they tell the story, uh, and then characteristic of a child, we did find that there are association between the cultural orientation so that the mothers who are higher on Chinese orientation reflected by both their language use and their you know, media use and then their social relationships and the behavior domains of engagement in the Chinese culture, they are associated with less emotion talk. So the mothers who are more engaging in the Chinese culture, they do you know, use less emotion talk and story talk, um, storytelling with children. Um, they use fewer emotion words, they have a lower quality of emotion discussion. So the next question coming in mind is that yes, there seems to be, this is you know, consistent with cross-cultural research that Chinese parents compared to European American parents, they use less emotion talk, and even among the Chinese American parents, those who are more you know, traditional, you know, engaging Chinese culture, they also use less emotion talk. But does you know, the function of emotion talk you know, um, uh, change by culture? So in another way, that the influence of parent emotion talk on children's social emotional outcome is this similar or different across cultures? Um, so, you know, in research um, conducting in, in, in Western you know, families, that researchers found that parents who use a lot of emotion talks, children tend to develop better social emotional skills. And so many mechanisms that children develop better understanding of emotion, you know, they are better at regulating the emotion, they are better at coping with their emotion. So, emotion talk, at least in the European American culture, seems to be a protective, you know, promotive, you know, parenting practices. But we want to see whether this still applies to a culture where parents don't use a lot of emotion talk, or at least, you know, it's not the norm. Okay? And, and what we have found is that it actually the mechanism, the function is similar. So um, this we looked at longitudinally, we found that in the Chinese American families, the parents who use more emotion talks, um, at way one, over time, the children have better emotion regulatory skills. That's really by both parents and teachers. And the children also have you know, better ability to show sympathy with others and also have better social skills with the peer. So at least this shows that although culture may influence kind of the frequency or the norms of parents' use of emotion talk, it does not seem to change the function. So the emotion talk is still a beneficial behavior, you know, for children in immigrant families. 
Can I just ask a clarification? Yes. In that one, did you control for other factors that might also be strong influencers on emotional health for the children? Like we controlled for earlier levels of emotion regulation. So in that sense that you know, we use longitudinal data to put all children on the same scale at the first level, you know, at the early wave of emotion regulation, and then see all those parents engage more emotion talk, do they show more you know, uh, uh, control, emotion regulation. So that's kind of a statistical way of controlling for other confounding factors. But I'm sure there are a lot of other you know, confounding factors that's not captured by kind of baseline level of emotion regulation. Yeah, again, you know, this is all called you know, correlational. We're not doing any experimental manipulation. So, you know, the association is not causal, you know, uh, could, it's not necessarily causal by the design. Yeah, but great question. Yeah. And similarly, we did um, another thing we looked at is how parents express emotion. And as I mentioned, that researchers found differences in you, how you assess emotion expression. So here we, you know, in this study, we use two types of measure to assess how parents express an emotion. First, we just ask them to rate how often you express different type of emotion in the family. And also, we use the observation task where parents and child engage in an interaction activity, and then we videotape the parents' behaviors and emotion, and we ask coders to code the facial expression of emotion. Okay. So same thing, we look at is cultural orientation associated with how parents express emotions. And this was worked by a lot of former students of mine. And what we found is that it is, but it varies by how you measure emotion. It also varies by the domains of cultural engagement. So we found that cultural orientation in the language domains um, is associated with parents' self-reported emotion in the sense that the parents who have higher English proficiency they generally reported they, you know, expressing more emotions in the family. Okay. But this was not found in their actual displayed emotion behavior. So there was no association between language proficiency and the parents' actual display of emotion. But we did find that a cultural orientation in the domain of friendship. So if the parents are handing out a lot with American friends or non-Chinese friends, they actually display more facial and uh, non-verbal expression of uh, positive emotions in, with their children. So uh, this seems to suggest that you know, the domains of culture may impact emotions through different mechanisms. So it's possible that language may be impacting the values or beliefs about emotion expression. But you know, uh, cultural engagement like handing out or inter, you know, interracial contact may be impacting uh, emotions through observing. Right? So when you're handing out a lot with parents who express a lot of positive emotions to their children, you are learning that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that the way they're showing how different domains of cultural orientation may impact in behavior through different mechanisms. And, um, and again, we look at, you know, there's the function of emotion expression changed by culture. And what we found is it does not. So very similar <coughs> to findings from you know, European American families that the parents, Chinese parents who express more positive emotion, in general the children have better emotion regulation skills. And the parents who express more negative or you know, anger, frustration emotion with the children, the children have lower emotion regulatory skills. So culture does not seem to alter the function of parenting behavior, although it seems to shape kind of you know, the, the norms or you know, the, uh, the frequency of parenting behaviors. Um, so what I have you know, just summarized, you know, the work we've been doing so far is looking at how parents' cultural orientation impact parenting behaviors and how does that impact children's adjustment. But we have missed the big picture so far, which is the child's own cultural orientation. So how does the child's you know, language and cultural orientation shape parenting and their adjustment? And so this is the work we are trying, you know, trying to do right now. And for children growing up in immigrant families, especially for young children, language is an important gateway to culture. Uh, because if they you know, um, know the language, you know, then that, you know, they can be exposed to the media of that language, they can be exposed to the values. So that's why we, you know, in our current work, we focus on the language in the early development, because it's an important gateway to access them to the cultural components. 
So um, this is the study that we're currently doing, as Deborah mentioned. Um, it's a longitudinal study looking at bilingual and social emotional development in dual language learners. And um, one thing I want to kind of mention a little bit about dual language learner, that's something everyone is excited about, is the inductive function piece. And um, as you know that, you know, there's a lot of media coverage about that. So inductive functioning basically is our brain's control center. So if you think about brain as a corporation have different offices, the inductive functioning is the CEO. So what it does is try to do the planning, to do the monitoring, to do the coordination among different offices. And so inductive functioning are important skills, especially for children um, engaging in school and in academic learning. And what's interesting is that there is a group of research that shows that when you compare children who are bilingual, especially those who are balanced in two languages, with the children who are monolingual, and they tend to do better on some inductive functioning uh, tasks especially involving the ability to shift attention. So one of the things they do is they ask children to sort the um, cards by different dimensions. Sometimes they have to sort by color, sometimes they sort, have to sort by you know, the, the object. And, and the, the task is to see whether they can flexibly switch you know, by sorting different dimensions, and that's one of the components of inductive functioning. And so why, you know, so researchers found this kind of bilingual advantage, but they still haven't completely explained it, the mechanism. There are some hypotheses. One of the hypotheses is that for bilingual, because their brain have to simultaneously engage in two language system, and the two languages maybe, you know, have conflict with each other uh, because they are different, you know, rules, different grammars. And that's why their brain has to constantly engage in kind of the conflict resolution task. So the idea that if you're using this skill a lot, then you get better at it. So uh, an analogy that I, that I find useful is, you know, driving while talking. I know we're not supposed to do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but some people are very good at it, like Uber drivers, right? Because they do a lot of practice. So that's just one of the mechanisms that research in hypothesis may be explaining the potential bilingual advantage. But there's um, actually some caveat to keep in mind in that literature. Uh, oftentimes, it's kind of get over-exaggerated in the media, is that um, the bilingual advantage has not been found in all children who are bilingual or all children who are you know, dual language learners. So um, the bilingual advantage has not been consistently found in all components of executive functioning, um, for example, working memory. And also the bilingual um, advantage has not been found in children who acquire two languages sequentially. So it was mostly found in children who were simultaneously learning two languages. Basically from birth, they have two parents speak different languages. But they were not found in children who learn first one language and then the second language. It was also not found in children who are unbalanced in their proficiency. So children who may be predominantly English but knows a little bit Spanish it was not found in that population. And also interestingly research you know, found that the limited exposure to a second language, like um, an immersion, second language immersion program for half a day of instruction is not sufficient to show the bilingual advantage. So before you invest in the summer camp for your child to learn a second language, uh, you want to think twice. <laughs> um, so given that, you know, there's still a lot of controversy in the literature about, you know, where is the bilingual advantage? Who can have the bilingual advantage? And a lot of this literature is only comparing very small groups of bilingual children with monolingual. But as well I mentioned, that the dual language learners are a very diverse population in terms of a proficiency of two languages, when they are exposed to two languages, and you know, the language environment. So in our study, we just look at dual language learners, and then we want to focus on the heterogeneity in dual language learners. So we try to, in this new study, we try to measure, you know, um, these four, you know, uh, big developmental constructs, um, bilingual development, executive functioning, parent-child and teacher-child relationship, and social emotional development. So what we hope to do in a longitudinal setting is we can, you know, measuring all constructs over time and looking at the changes over time and see how they, you know, relate to each other in developmental so how are you know, English and heritage language development shaping children's elective functioning 
and how are they shaping children's social emotional development. Um, so there's some you know, new, uh, exciting components. So compared to our previous study, this study has two cultural groups, so Chinese-speaking, Chinese-American families, and then DLLs in Spanish-speaking, Mexican-American family. So this allows us to test you know, generalizability. So this you know, advantage is only found in one culture or one language group, or if something can be generalized. Okay. And we also focus on the low-income community, because that's a population that's a high need for services. And of course, the three-wave longitudinal uh, design was not something we achieved before. And then we also do you know, assessment of both the language environment and you know, other aspects of development across the home and school setting. So that allow us to look at you know, kind of more uh, a bigger picture of the child's development. Um, we have, you know, just quickly mentioned before we did the study, we did do a pilot, you know, pilot sample of two cultural groups. Um, and then we have some, you know, preliminary findings. The first of all is that we are able to recruit two cultural groups that are relatively matched on the socioeconomic status. So in the pilot sample, we got two groups of children from Head Start, Chinese American and Mexican American. And then we actually found they're actually quite similar. So, you know, this uh, they are quite similar in both socioeconomic status, the child's language development, and you know language environment. But in the whole sample, there's a wide range of variability in children's language, you know, uh, uh, executive functioning. But the cultural differences is actually pretty small when you control for socioeconomic status. And um, and and the preliminary finding just use cross-sectional, you know, small sample. Um, we demonstrated that you know this is generalizable to both groups. That the children's heritage and um, English vocabulary they actually independently relates to the parent-child relationship. Of course, this is correlational. So we found that children with stronger heritage language vocabulary that the parents reported using more supportive parenting, like warmth, reasoning, and which in turn is associated with benefits in children's social emotional adjustment. And then the children who have stronger English vocabulary, their parents reported using less coercive, so they were less kind of forcing. So in another sense, that this shows that both heritage and English you know, language proficiency have benefits for parenting. And um, in another paper, we look at executive function piece. And, and you know, in this study, we showed that Kind of similar to the you know the cross group comparison, but we found that in, in the group of dual language learners, the levels of English and uh, heritage language proficiency both independently come for benefits in executive functioning, but only in the in the um, domain of attention shifting. So we use kind of a similar type of you know sorting task. So in the sense that you know the true language proficiency do have additive effects. So if you are stronger in Spanish you get some benefit in attention shifting, and if you're stronger in English, you get additional benefits. Okay. So um, the progress for the R01, we are you know, still, it's a big study, some of you know, our team are here, and, um, but we've made some progress so far. You know, we partner with over 60 preschool centers, majority of them Head Start. We phone screen over 400 families, and we've done assessment for about 130 families. So those are you know, research assistant at how you know doing recruitment, you know, and, and, and you know uh, outreach events at you know preschool head start preschools all over the Bay Area, including Sacramento and the Bay Area, you know, uh, the Bay Area. So take home message so far, you know, we're just starting, so we have a lot of things to learn. But what I'm seeing the kind of big message is that cultural orientation is a fluid and dynamic process in immigrant families and they shape children's adjustments through multiple pathways. And then immigrant children's contact or engagement with their host and heritage language may sometimes pose risk in some domain but benefit in other domains, depending on the cultural elements, the social process, and the developmental period. So it's something that it's not a simple picture that more American is good or more Chinese is bad. So it's, you know, it depends on what domains you're looking at, what developmental periods, you know, and, and then, you know, what processes. And which is what we're trying to find is the more specificity in what areas that, you know, heritage language provides benefit and in what areas that 
you know, heritage culture may pose some risk, and then we can, in, you know, implement in, in with uh, intervention. Okay. And, you know, of course, you know, this, you know, you cannot be done, you know, especially with non-experimental design, that longitudinal data is really important because we can look at changes, you know, all this construct, like cultural orientation and language, and adjustment are changing. So to understand change, you have to follow individuals over time, so you can map onto you know you know their developmental trajectories. So some of the implications for you know clinical work, because I'm a clinical psychologist, to talk about mental health services. You know, one thing I talk to clinicians is that it's important to do a thorough assessment of cultural orientation for immigrants. So don't make assumptions just because this individual comes from Mexico, it must be very traditional. You have to do assessment on the language, to do assessment on the individual's identity, to do assessment on different you know, domains of cultural orientation to get a better understanding of the individual's levels in the culture. So do not make, just make assumptions based on, you know, uh, you know group variable. And there's also, you know, clinicians need to pay sensitivity to the you know, cultural related variations in emotion expression and emotion communication. And, you know, the study on emotion talk, this provides some evidence that right now the all parent training program that have been developed and tested in, you know, majority European American family that they focus on teaching parents how to use effective emotion talk skills. And our study then showed that this kind of intervention could benefit immigrant family because we found that emotion talk has similar, you know, uh, impact on children's adjustment in immigrant families. So just because it's not something you know in that culture doesn't mean that the family cannot learn the benefit from it. Um, and then there's some implication for education. Um, basically, you know, it's like idea is that there's some initial evidence that there is benefit both social emotional and uh, executive function benefit for both heritage language development and English language development. So if there are ways for schools, you know, and uh, uh, families to, you know, promote children's dual language development, you know, uh, in a rich language environment, then, you know, uh, instead of trying to, you know, uh, highlighting one language over the other, or try to, you know, inhibit one language over the other, I think that's, you know, of some an area that you know uh, uh, schools and parents can get more educated about, about the benefits of you know both home language and English language in children, especially early development. Okay. So um, I want to um, acknowledge that I mean, this work is a lot of people, <laughs> say hundreds of research assistants, as you know, it's all hard work doing you know home assessment, doing lab assessment. And um, you know I couldn't put everyone's name on it, but if I put on them, there will be pages. And so uh, we can really cannot do this work without you know all the wonderful students at UC Berkeley. And that's you know the best thing I have in my career is to uh, get to work with you know the students from very diverse cultural background and and, and very enthusiastic and passionate about you know uh, the work we're doing. So and um, thank you. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Yes. Hi. Um, so thank you for that talk. I, I really appreciated the inclusion of Roth and Brenner's ecological model. And I think one of the things that kept coming up for me in your talk was um, the emphasis on the sort of specific unit being this like parent-child unit. And it sort of felt like there wasn't really sort of the macro or like chronospherical attention to how within a US context like race and xenophobia is like, a, and the racism and xenophobia is an enormous thing. And that if we're talking about immigrant or children or immigrant families coming in and sort of taking on the cultural values of the, the now host country, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that my question is like, I'm, I'm wondering how you see taking on values of racism and xenophobia playing into <coughs> the ways that um, people sort of like learn languages or like prioritize languages or adapt to their new environments. Um, and I and I and sort of paired with that, mm -hmm. I feel like I know that you said that like it, you're not saying that 
parents should necessarily be more like Americans, but it, it does feel like that. It does feel like what you're saying, or what these studies are saying, is that uh, when immigrant families act more like white families, then their parents and their kids have better outcomes, and that feels troubling and problematic to me, and I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, you know, you basically, you know, would point, in cross-cultural research, there's always a balance between, you know, testing what's generalizable cross-cultural, what's similar cross-cultural, versus what's unique, you know, cross-cultural. So I think in our work, because we, we, you know, use a lot of quantitative approaches, and a lot of quantitative measures were originally developed for, you know, one cultural group. So we're trying to use it to generalize to another culture. So, you know, we, you know, our research probably captures less the unique aspect or the unique assets of each culture. But I do think the generalizability piece is important because, you know, there are interventions that has been developed that can benefit parents and children that was developed in one culture. So do we just throw out that work and, do, you know, do a whole new study on new culture? Or we can see if the intervention is common components that can be generalized to another culture that can be adapted. So I think that's kind of a balance we're taking with that. We try to look at some of the general developmental processes that has been you know, shown to be beneficial for children of all cultures, like parental um, warmth or you know, uh, use of reasoning, and to see if they can be generalized to immigrant families. Because that's something that has been shown to be beneficial. And, and you need empirical evidence to show that they are related to child's outcome in similar ways in another culture before you generalize that intervention. But I agree that they are, you know, a uh, uh, component, unique aspect that's for, you know, each in, in, in individual culture that can be beneficial for children's development. And I think that's something that, you know, um, um, could be captured by other, you know, uh, research methods, like qualitative methods or kind of more focused group type of methods. And it's something that we try to expand, you know, in our work. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, from our methodological transition, we tend to be more um, quantitative focus. Yeah. I, 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 I appreciate that response. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to push back a little bit. Like, there definitely are critical approaches to doing quantitative methodologies mm -hmm. that don't reproduce sort of colonial models of understanding family dynamics and family systems. And just because something has been done and there is a, an established measure on it, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we need to keep reproducing it, particularly if reproducing it reinforces traditions or systems that do create hierarchies within people that is what we see here. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, at other parties about you know, clinical work intervention development that, you know, what can you learn to be, you know, turn into intervention that can benefit, you know, families of different cultural backgrounds and then the adaptation approach and sometimes can be more efficient than developing kind of intervention. So. Yeah, I mean, as a licensed clinical social worker providing mental health care services to families, I, I, I hear that and I see that. Again, I think that this kind of research that doesn't, that does not sort of question how families are interacting with a social environment that is explicitly violent for them is sort of missing some huge aspects to how these, these processes can be working. If, so, if we're talking about social emotional learning and people are operating throughout their days where they are being told by the narratives around them that they're less, that they're less, then that probably has an impact on how they learn emotions mm -hmm. and socialize with people around. Yeah, that's I I agree. You know, yeah, we do have you know limitations in our thinking, which is why I could come to talk to interdisciplinary you know, audience to get a different perspective. Yes. I just before I ask my question, I just wanted to say that's the most interesting question I've heard presented in the talk in a long time. Thanks. Um, so the, one of the dangers with these longitudinal studies mm -hmm. that are extraordinarily rich in their data sets mm -hmm. um, is that there's 5,000 combinations of different things that you can do. And you can come up with a thousand stories that fit the data. Some piece of the data. You'll notice in your in your analysis there was, you know, different kinds of, you know, you have different levels of children's language, mm -hmm. learning uh, first, second, simultaneously, strong in one, weak in one. 
you have all kinds of domains of different skills that they have. Um, there's so many combinations that how do you fight back against the idea that you can tell a story, but it's more like a novel. It's a story, it's interesting, it's informative, but it's not necessarily factual. And you know, one of the techniques that's often used is you decide exactly what you're going to study before you start, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, you limit your focus to that, as opposed to mining out different parts of the data. And I just wonder how you work with your grad students on yeah. how to do this. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, a, a very important, you know, um, kind of methodological, you know, uh, question for the work we do because we cannot manipulate, you know, we cannot do experimental manipulations of, you know, a lot of things we study, like, you know, parenting behaviors, like, you know, cultural orientation. So the method we use, you know, is collect a lot of kind of data and then, um, but in our work, what we try to do is we rely on theory, so we don't just randomly testing all hypotheses. That we went to the literature and then you know carefully study literature based on prior work and form hypotheses, and then we test you know the hypothesis with the data. But of course that's different from you setting up your experiment, you know setting up your hypothesis and then run your experiment. We cannot go back and do it, you know all data has been collected. So it does still has kind of that data mining approach. But we try to do more conscientious in the process is that all hypothesis is you know coming from higher work. You know, it's not you know coming from you know, random, you know, impression. It was based on work from other researchers using similar sample or using similar population and then we try to add things to that work so that we can make progress, you know, in, in this line of work. Yeah, but that is different from kind of experimental approaches where you can control, you know, you can manipulate, you know, all the variables and, and decide. I have one question. Yeah. Sorry, I was up for a second, so you certainly <coughs> must might have asked this already, but I'm interested in um, the sequential nature of language acquisition. So, and there's been a lot of research on this, and it's um, really debated, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, for instance, there's some families that feel the most important thing is to really solidify the heritage language and that the child is very proficient and comfortable and that you introduce English um, a bit later, maybe in kindergarten. You know, they're going to be absorbing it through various means, in any case, in their life living in the United States. And then, maybe in kindergarten, they learn a little bit more first grade a little bit more. So by the time they're, say, eight or nine, they could be, be quite proficient and comfortable in both languages, but not at two and three. And there's, there's strong evidence for that, mm -hmm. because the, the two or three-year-olds tend to give up their English, I mean, tend to give up their heritage language for English, and then that kind of goes by the wayside. So I was just wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, language development is not really my domain of expertise, uh, which is why I have a collaborator whose you know, expertise is on language development. But in our study, we you know, try to capture the variability so that you know, we recruit children. We have, you know, so far the sample we've got, they vary a lot in their you know, uh, dual language proficiency. Some children are very dominant in English, and some children are you know, very dominant you know, in in, in heritage language, and we do, you know, ask very specific questions about their timing, and you know, uh, try to capture that information. So, you know, we can able be able to really at least describe, you know, what's the variabilities in, you know, the different language. But, you know, I can't really say what's my hypothesis because that's not really, you know, um, uh, my, you know, my domain of activity. Yeah. 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 So. Given this is an interdisciplinary space, yeah. forgive this question. Um, your, what are the implications of your study to this point? Um, and given that we live in a culture that has all kinds of priorities built into it, what are the implications of your studies for the training of clinicians mm -hmm. in psychology? Mm -hmm and also for the structure of early childhood education in the US. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, you know, the implication, the main message I give when I talk to Canadians and teachers is to understand culture and, you know, language and understand, you know, the challenges and opportunities facing immigrant families. Yeah, and I think you know the first step is to not make any assumptions on this is good or this is bad. The first step is to understand you know how how does the pet, you know what are the things the family value to understand the family from their culture. And I think that's the first step of planning their work. And structure of early childhood education. <laughs> I think you know my collaborator which I would say that you know whatever you can to support your language you know development. And, and you know, um, uh, in my, I can tell from my personal experience, you know, um, um, I'm an immigrant and first generation, and my children second generation. It is very hard to, you know, for children born in the U.S. to keep up the heritage language. And as parents, they are, you know, we have many kind of struggles. So you know, like, is Chinese gonna hurt English? You know, and and, and do you want to force the child to learn Chinese? So how? What's the best way to support the heritage language? So I'm hoping the work that we do, we can provide some more specificity. You know, at least one, one aspect is that how can we balance both the social emotional benefits and cognitive so that we not just say, learning two languages is good, but not at the expenses of them making a child, you know, hate the language or hate the culture. And so I think, you know, if we, you know, the work we can do, can see there are ways we can promote both social emotional and then, you know, cognitive function with the supporting of two languages then I think that would be a better outcome than just emphasizing one woman than the other. I have a kind of a related question yeah. to that. I think I remember from the grant proposal you were also looking at teachers' attitudes towards mm -hmm. bilingualism. And so have, do you have anything about that yet? Because I mean that, yeah. Yeah, we do have measures. Because uh, uh -huh. we do collect data from the teacher um, about their attitudes towards bilingualism, the attitudes towards, you know, um, um, the child's language and also the teacher's own kind of background. Um, so, you know, again, we want to look at how does that <coughs> impacting, you know, the children's language, does that, you know, change the relationship between, you know, bilingual and social emotional outcome. It's something that we, we hope to, you know, we hope to, you know, um, explore, you know, in that. <coughs> I want to follow up on the earlier question and talk about there's a possibility that there's a colonial bias. Mm -hmm. In the data you've presented so far, the families that had a facility in both languages, their, their competence was additive in terms, particularly in terms of changing, uh, uh, changing adapting to changing, what, how do you describe it? Cha uh, changing activities or uh, attention shifting. Attention yes. shifting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's an identification that European-oriented English speakers, the family, the parent-child relationship, was more effective and more focused on developing skills and discussion of emotion. The result of more skill at attention shifting. But if we look at educational testing. U.S. performance of children at all ages is so far behind these so-called backward cultures and attention shifting, it raises fundamental questions about the nature of the scaling of competence and effectiveness if the people who supposedly can't shift outperform and the people who can shift underperform. What do we do with that? Um, I, I think, you know, there are, it, it is a valid concern that, you know, a lot of the, you know, um, testing, like, you know, cognitive testing, achievement testing was biased because they were, you know, developed based on, you know, more lingual English speaking children, and, and which is, you know, including the cognitive type of test. So that, that is, you know, um, you know a, a, a limitation that, you know, researchers are aware of. Yeah. And that's with reference to both mon monolingual and either language? Um, uh, I, I'm not well, I think, I think Dana's talking about kids from Asian families mm -hmm. doing well academically, but mm -hmm. your study didn't look at academic outcomes, right? 
we have not done any comparison between, you know, uh, like Chinese families or, you know, European micro families. You did compare, you said that the European model or communication style of European families pro provided greater protection or support for attention shifting, which suggests that's better performance, that's more competence. But, but if you look at cognitive and, and substantive testing, mm -hmm. Asian children from all kinds of different countries ex extremely outperform European children or European origin children in the United States. So yeah. that raises questions about what constitutes competence and, uh, and can, can, put it this way. You know, one of the big things whenever you're in, in especially middle school, but it's probably in elementary school, is whenever you change tasks, the kids, I can't find my pencil, then someone starts playing, they horse around, you know, so every time you change tasks, it can be a problem. And so, Pete, and, and one would expect based upon your data that the children that have superior <coughs> ability and attention shifting, they would, could do better at transitioning across in different task environments. But, although I don't know, the, the, the other more traditional kind of education seems to result in high performance on perhaps more cognitive root stuff, but with very high levels of performance, which seems to problematize the notion of what constitutes effective cognitive adjustment. Mm -hmm. And so what, you know, how do you deal with those very different frames for assessing what constitutes com <coughs> competence and effectiveness in terms of cognitive engagement in ways that may create a emotional side effects? Yeah, I think that's a very good, you know, um, um, complicated question. It's oftentimes when people make cross-cultural comparisons, uh -huh. like there's cross-cultural differences in achievement, there's cross-cultural differences in cognitive development, and then they are showing that that's the, the differences in achievement is due to differences in achievement, but uh, in cognitive function. But that's not the case in research. The research actually has not shown that cognitive, you know, uh, 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 attention shifting, how do they function differently across cultures? So the mechanism across culture has not been studied. But oftentimes these people, you know, looking at the outcome, there's a cultural difference in the outcome, then you know they try to make hypotheses what are the differences explaining the outcome, but it's not being you know studied actually. In my work I, I did early work on cross cultural studies and then it got frustrated because when you find something different you cannot explain because uh -huh. there's you know cultural find that you know Asian children actually perform better on some executive functioning tasks compared to American children. But that was never explained. There was no study actually show is it because of teachers' strategy, is it because of parenting strategy? They all just make assumptions, you know, make you know interpretation and discussion. They was never tested. Actually researchers have not actually found you know the actual causes of their cultural differences. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question. Have you looked into reverse migration? So people mm -hmm. moving back to their heritage and culture and seeing how the kids are performing if they go back to the parents' culture? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting you know, uh, uh, question. We haven't actually studied yeah. in that. Um, you know, in, in our longitudinal sample over 10 years, we, we got about 60% of family was still kind of reachable and after 10 years. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think they are, you know, fair amount of family that may have moved back. But because of our approach, we couldn't, you know, really reach out to them. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I think it'll be something, you know, I know there's some researchers studying um, that, um, you know, parasite, you know, children, or children who, whose parents were in China, but they, they send a child here to, to yeah. go to school. Yeah. yeah, so there are, you know, many interesting kind of migrant populations yes. that we interested in study. It would just be very interesting to see, you know, how would, for instance, a Chinese child react to going back to China using more yeah. facial expressions in the does not. Yeah. In our early work, we did study of uh, children in China, yes. and we used some of the similar measures, but we haven't been able to kind of really looking at across, you know, cultural groups, so yeah. Chinese children in China, the Chinese American children, uh, but we are starting to do that as we're getting data from different samples, so we can look at those 
you know, cause group differences and also within group kind of behaving attitude. Uh, well, maybe we'll end there and stay for informal discussion. Those who would like to, um, please join me in thanking Professor Chapman.